Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. So I decided to do a series on uh, an overview of the Upanishads. And in response to a request, can we not have the very basics of the Vedanta explained to us? Of course, to give any exp exposition of the entire subject of the Upanishads will take us many, many weeks and months probably. So this is a helicopter view. And that means that the way in which we introduce the subject is to have some kind of overview and then to see if we can drill down into more details about it. Uh, firstly, we have to understand what are the principles of so-called Hinduism. I often ask Hindus this question, when your children go to European schools or in Ireland Irish schools, then uh, when they are challenged, when they're asked on the basis that we are Christian or we are Muslim, what are you Hindus all about? Then they're stuck. They're stuck with a, a question mark. They have no idea what it is. So uh, the escape route is to say, ah, it's just a way of life. It's not really a religion. But the reason why children say that is because parents say that. And the reason why parents say that is another way of saying, we have no idea what Hinduism is. We think we know, we follow this teacher or that teacher or this group or that group. And we're well familiar with the stories in the Puranas and the mythologies. And we also um, understand the Itihasas, that is the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, that is the historical accounts brought to us. These are very popular. But the confusion is that nobody drills down to what are the basics and the basics essentially are the Vedas. Without these Vedas, none of the rest makes any sense. And because there is so much material, so many scriptures, so much literature, there's a great confusion. Very often, when Hindus are accused, as it were, of being a polytheistic religion, they are greeted. I once went to an interfaith uh, seminar and the facilitator, maybe well-meaningly, said, see, there are two groups of religions, monotheistic religions, and you put all the Abrahamic religions on that side of it. Of course, some, some monotheistic religions are left out completely, such as, for example, Sikhism is a monotheistic religion in the classical sense, and Baha'ism is also a monotheistic and Abrahamic religion. These somehow get mixed out of the mix but on the other side, he put as a juxtaposition Hinduism. Hinduism is polytheism, he says. And there's a great misunderstanding. And this misunderstanding has led to a lot of bloodshed and persecution from uh, Muslims, for example, who have, as a real bugbear, inherited from both Christianity and Judaism, this idea of so-called idolatry. The question of idolatry goes back millennia, and essentially it stems from tribalism, where two types of gods compete with each other, one tribal god being prayed to in order to create a victory on the other side, and the other one having a counter god creating a victory on that side. And of course, if my tribe wins, and overcomes your tribe, that means my God is much more powerful than yours. These tribal deities in the Semitic world code are called Molech. And so my Molech becomes better than yours, superior to yours. And then that means my tribe is quite special. And so the Israelites identified themselves as chosen people, particularly and especially protected by God their God, of course, and they deemed this God to be Yahweh. 
And so the whole of religious life and social life became integrated as some allegiance toward this deity that acted as a tribal chief, masculine in gender, because tribal chiefs were masculine. And so a contract is made, a covenant, an agreement. We agree to do this, and in return, we get your protection. And whenever any calamity in society occurs, it is because we upset this God, we breached the contract in some way. So this was the fairly primitive idea of those days. And sometimes we have to go through this level of primitivism in the anthropology of religion. So this misunderstanding of polytheism should be done away with because it is not that a stone is being put in front and worshiped. That's not the idea about it. There is a symbol. And Swami Vivekananda illustrated it very nicely. He was in a royal court. He was challenged by the prime minister. Yes, yes, all this Hinduism, fine, but I don't believe at all in these in this image, images and uh, idolatry is all superstitious and degrading. We should do away with it. Of course, Vivekananda himself had this idea at one stage, but his master was committed to worshiping in every single form and accepting every symbol and form, seeing the forms as a live entity by his own personal experience and visions. So Vivekananda pointed out a portrait of the Maharaj and said, well, please take this portrait down. Would you mind stamping on it? Or oh, I couldn't possibly do that. He said, well, why not? It's just canvas, just made from paint and materials assembled. So that's the difficulty. The symbol, symbol is identified with what it represents. So to start with, this word Hindu and Hinduism is really a misnomer applied as a, a term describing a set of religious beliefs and practices, but taken from a geographic origin, that is, that the river Indus, or Sindh, I should say, in the province of Sindh, represented a kind of boundary for invaders, Greeks, Persians, etc. And this province of Sindh, when the Persians came along, they couldn't really say Sindh. They can't say Ashra, they say Ahra. They can't say Sindh, they have to say Hind. So Hindu, anybody south of that river, is a Hindu. Now, currently, people south of that river are many and varied in their religious allegiance. Muslims are there, Parsis are there, uh, Hindus, uh, as they're commonly called, are there, Jains are there, Buddhists are there, Christians are there. Every kind of belief is there. So applying this geographic term to religion is a misnomer and nowhere in the Hindu scriptures will you find this word. So, so really, when you say, what is this Hindu, Hinduism? What is the proper name? Many Hindus will apply this term Sanatana Dharma. That is an eternal law of religion. But when you ask, what is that? They can't answer and simply shrug their shoulders and say, it's a way of life. This is an escape hatch, which is a lazy way of, under, of portraying. We actually don't know. So let us go through the five principles that constitute so-called Hinduism, and let us call it from here on by its proper name. And we call it, call it either the Vedaka religion or Vedanta. When I started these talks at our new premises, one uh, man, Indian Hindu man said, I've never heard of this term. What is this Vedanta, the Vedanta society? What does it mean? And I received a little bit of a shock. I thought everybody understood this principle. So the first principle in the so-called Hindu religion is, and we call it the Vedika religion or the Vedanta to make the point. Vedika having allegiance to the Vedas. Vedanta having allegiance to the essential part, 
the real driving part. That is, all of the religion and the philosophy is derived from the essence of the Vedas, this Vedanta, literally the end of the Vedas, the final conclusion of the Vedas. And everything, even the mythology, is based on the sound philosophical principles. So this is the most ancient philosophy in the world, predating Greek philosophy and, and any other form of philosophy that we have. And it forms a solid basis of principles in response to inquiries. So the first principle really is, we believe in the authority of the Vedas because they are seen to be expired or expirated from one source, a supreme principle. And they are shruti, that means they are perennial, they are eternal. There is no theology in it. There is no um, necessarily person involved in it as a central figure. There is no basis to think that any literature derived from it, that is Vedas as a written text, is in any way complete or in any way uh, something that should be relied on solely. There is no sola scriptura in this system. So first principle we can put on one hand, first finger, on the basis that if you ask a Buddhist what do you believe in, one hand can be used for principles. Life is suffering. And secondly, there is a cause, there's a reason for the suffering. And uh, there is a way, as, there's a cause that causes desire and there is a way out also called the Eightfold Path. Now you have two hands held. Buddhism, in summary. You ask a Muslim, what do you believe? Five pillars can be presented, one hand is used. In this same way, in this popularly known as Hinduism, one hand can be used with five principles. First principle is we believe in the authority of the Vedas as the eternal message, the eternal truth. That is, they always existed. And that is that it is like gravity. Gravity was discovered, it is already there. Everybody accepts it to be true. In this same way, Internally, everybody has an internal instinct about the truth. Secondly, there's a supreme principle. This principle is called in these Upanishads as Brahman, derived from the root Brahman, inferring to grow, to expand infinitely. If you are familiar with the cosmological model of the Big Bang, you'll accept that there was something like a Brahman and then an expansion. So we can see that there is a root behind it in answer to one of the questions that is asked by thinking people, what is the root? We assume there's a root. So a certain presumption is made. Within that scope, therefore, that principle that is fundamental in us, namely humans, technically called Atman, self, is either connected with or one with that Brah, that Brahman. Third principle is that nature as we understand it, that is the whole of the observable phenomena in front of us, that is eternal. It has no beginning, it has no end. It is comprised of three evolutionary forces. Fourthly, there are four approaches, psychological ways to understand the validity of this truth. These are called yogas. The easiest and most convenient of these will be love of God. That is personalizing this Brahman and forming a relationship with it as a way of purifying the mind. But the final, final conclusion that we have has to be from direct perception. And within that method, there is a very important principle. This principle is described as a chosen ideal. Ishta Devata is technically what it is. That is, I can form any form or concept I like for that which is inconceivable. Because that Brahman has no 
parts in space and no change in evolution, how will I therefore relate to it? So some kind of concept, something that brings us within the scope of our human understanding as a placeholder concept that would reveal the truth to us. And because of this liberality in understanding, not polytheism, but uh, this is pluralism. Pluralism means many, many ways. Every way is a way. And because of this, the fifth principle is really the harmony of religions, that every approach is the way. So this is described in that succinct statement of Swami Vivekananda, that each soul is potentially divine. That is, each Atman has a potentiality of realizing their connectedness or oneness with that supreme principle. And the goal is to manifest this from within. That's what our whole life is all about. And this modern thinking calls evolution. And in doing this, we control nature, internal and external, because if the subtle forces of nature are understood and are mobilized by the subtlest of energies called thought, then we can control the nature. Mechanically, in an engineering sense, we can create huge dams without waiting for millions of years for evolutionary progress to grow us wings. With a desire to fly, we invent an aircraft. We engineer it properly using man's brain power, and we're able to fly above the clouds. Nowadays, there are very, very heavy, uh, incredibly heavy aircraft engineered and designed to be completely aerofoil and to take advantage of velocity and the air's capacity to lift something. And so we find ourselves flying way above the skies at great altitudes, tons and tons of material. And then, uh, the goal is to manifest this divinity from with, within, controlling nature internally and external, and then do this by these several methods described, either by philosophy or psychic control, by worship, or by work, by one or more, or all of these, and be free. And then what we characterize normally as religion, unfortunately, as the differences elucidating this harmony of religions that books and rituals and temples and churches, all of these are but secondary details. So this is a wonderful succinct explanation, but it all stems back to these Vedas. So having said that, let us now explore what we mean by the first principle, these Vedas. So you are probably aware there are four Vedas. Actually, most of the Vedas has been lost to us. Still, we have four surviving Vedas, the oldest being the Rig Veda. And all of these four Vedas would have had in its day various recensions. Now we have two recensions for the Yajur Veda. This is the Shukla. The Shukla Yajur Veda, or Shukla Yajur Samhita, and the Krishna, the dark, the white and the dark, or the white and the black recensions. And all of these Vedas have certain portions. Samhita portion is to do with songs and hymns and poetry of praises to the various forces of nature. These forces are not just mythological forces. The Vedas are written in coded language, according to some, that tells us about cosmology and physics, what this world is constructed of and how it is constructed. And those who study this will be easily be able to identify the presence of modern physics. So that is the one portion. These are the Samhitas. Then, of course, there are the Brahmanas. Brahmanas will describe the ritualistic portion of things. And that is, how do we mobilize things so that we control 
nature, internal and external. And then the Aranyakas will be there, literally the forest portions. And that is all the mythological or representation uh, of these Brahmanas through story form. In other words, an exp explaining more the practical portion of these ritualistic rituals. Now, so far, this is all to do with this world and the next world, that is here and hereafter, making sure that everything functions well. And for this reason, these are called the karma kanda, that is the portion to do with acts and actions. But the philosophical portion is of a different flavor. It's called jnana kanda, all to do with knowledge. This is the Upanishads. And these four sections are contained in each and every Upanishad, uh, each and every Veda. But the Upanishads, because they come at the end of it, are called Vedanta, that is end of Vedas. So to this extent, Upanishads and Vedanta is the same thing. And the principles contained in this, these Upanishads, is also called Vedanta. There are different Upanishads that are connected with each Veda and not necessarily systematically laid out. For this, we have to go to another text, which is called the Brahma Sutras or the Vedanta Sutras. These Vedanta Sutras or Brahma Sutras will systematically go through these Upanishads because these Upanishads will be question and answer sessions between teachers and students. And the principal questions will be at the root, at the start of these Upanishads. That is, having understood the Karma Kanda portion of the Vedas, some seeds of inquiry would have to be there. The seeds of the inquiry would be, what is this world rooted in? Even today, it is a human question that many people don't find any answer to. But there is an assumption that something has to come from a root, like a tree. When we examine a tree, we see the unseen, the unseen root is inferred below it. And so there's an inferential logic which says that all of this is here and it is made from various parts identified in space and we find a movement in time, and it cannot just arrive spontaneously. There must be some root. Observing the whole of nature, that's what we see. What is the root? And root means that the root and the tree, if you use that as an example, will not be separate. There is a connectedness. Very, very important concept. That means there's no question of creation coming here, because the root, does not create the tree, it simply manifests it, it grows. So this idea of growth is there, and it comes back to this principle of Brahman. Then the second simple question would be, from what would this endless variety that comprise the observed universe, where is it proceeding from? This is a different question to what is the root? So what is the next step? of the root, where is it all proceeding from? And what is the order of the procession that is taking place or manifestation that we finally come to see as this world of ours? And then how can we understand and know this supreme reality, this root, this source of this progression? Is there a method by which we can do it? And how does this supreme reality become this, as it were? And then how are we related to this? And how is everything related to everything else? Now, these four essential questions are deep questions, but they are also human questions. They come from a curiosity. It comes from drawing a line and saying, 
I can no longer accept this world in its day-to-day -day way as in any way conclusive. And in this world, I find if I do that, many, many obstacles and problems and difficulties come. And therefore, this is not just highbrow philosophy. The great, great question is, how can I remove misery from this world? And so the practical portion of studying this is to implement some kind of formula that will deal with the practical problems. If I don't get to the root cause of something, Right now, very often in medical practice, there is a tendency to deal with the symptoms, not necessarily the causes. Naturopaths will tell us that the symptoms or the effects are not adequate. And they give the simile of, or the example of a donkey, a donkey cannot walk. Well, it would be madness to say, let us give her leg transplant. If a donkey is overloaded with timber and all kinds of goods and shuttles and so on, then you take them off and then the donkey walks fine. So to find out what is the root cause of everything today in modern science, there's an urge to reconcile two areas of science that are conflicting and see if there is some root cause of everything, some one generalized thing from which everything else can come. So it is natural that when we try to explore truth, something that is enduring, we look for the most subtle and highest generalized position we can find. The root, in other words. So the Vedas are the oldest, in fact, the Upanishads are the oldest religious and philosophical text in the world. And they are discovering things which are already there, nothing to be invented. And these can sometimes be personalized to bring us within this range of understanding in various ways as uh, either something like a person or something like oneness or something like a word, for example, om. And in this way, all things are known in a personalized way that leads us to the experiential understanding of this oneness. So just to review, Vedanta and Upanishads are synonymous terms, and they're all to do with what is called Brahma Vidya, that is knowledge of Brahman. Now, for those unfamiliar with these terms, it's necessary to explain, there are several terms that we should not confuse this word Brahman with. Brahma is one of them. Brahma refers to that personalized aspect, which is something like a creative cosmic mind. Secondly, we should not confuse this term with the Brahmanas, that is that portion of the Vedas that has to do with the ritualistic portion. Nor should we confuse it with Brahmanas, that is those priests or those of a special social order that are to do with the ritualistic portion and teaching portion and exemplary portion of the knowledge of Brahman. So this is a something of an overview. Let's take a, how many Upanishads there are. Well, I think by the 14th century of this current era, it was said that there were something like 52 Upanishads. In other places, we find a list of 108 Upanishads. But we take the oldest Upanishads that are connected to the Samhitas, these portions. And we can easily see that 13 of these will be principal. These can also be reduced often to 10. But let us see. The Rig Veda itself will contain the Aitari Upanishad and the Koshitaki Upanishads. The Yajurveda in its Shukra form, its recension like that, will contain the 
Brahtaranyakupanishad and the issue of Krishna Veda, recension, will contain a number of Upanishads. Contain the Taittiriya Upanishad, Katu Upanishad, the Maitri Upanishad, and the Shvetashvatara Upanishads. The Samaveda will contain naturally the Chandogya Upanishad and the Kena Upanishads. And then the Atharva Veda will contain the Mundaka Upanishad, the Mandukya Upanishad, and the Prashna Upanishads. Now, let's not be confused by these terms. It's just for your understanding what fits into where. But the summary of it is simply to say that Upanishads are a portion of this. And sometimes they come out in the Aranyaka portion, and sometimes they come out in the Brahmana portion. But these are all at the end of the Vedas and are our final conclusion in answer to these various questions. What is the importance of life? What is this knowledge that we should have that gives us an understanding of the base of the universe and gives us a practical understanding how to get there? I mentioned previously that in order to understand these Upanishads, firstly, we find commentaries from every school of thought that are now allocated into three directions, three approaches. One approach, I am here as an individual, and I see this supreme principle as something that I am connected to. And in my relationship and intensity with this relationship with this, I can tap in, the, I can tap from it the sweetness and the honey from it. And from this, I can become an enlightened being. This is characterized by the philosopher Madhva. Second approach will be this connectedness I see not as something that is dualistic, but I can see that there's a connectedness like a spark and a fire. Spark and a fire are connected. Or the rays of sun and the sun itself or smoke and fire, just to give you some analogies. So this is characterized by the philosopher Ramanuja. And then ultimately Shankaracharya gives us some idea from a non-dualistic perspective. Now the way we view things in the Vedanta is that these are not separate things. These are progressive things. And we probably have to go through each one as a starting point, because we feel a duality, we may as well start there. And so there is no, there is no cancellation of any position in order for me to go to a certain place, let's just say in Ireland, for me to get to Galway, I have to go through Athlone. I don't eliminate Athlone. For me to climb a mountain, I start off at the bottom, I can't just jump to the top. Of course, practically speaking, we can on rare occasions. But for most of us, we have to take the journey. And as a great philosopher, Nissen, <laughs> said, the manufacturer of cars, life is a journey, enjoy the ride. So what does this word Upanishad mean? Uh, broadly speaking, it means secret and therefore sacred knowledge. And according to the Upanishads, self-knowledge, that is, the knowledge of the inmost reality in us alone, really is spiritual knowledge. And this knowledge confers spiritual freedom. And so our goal is this spiritual freedom. And so the Upanishads, for this reason, they impart knowledge of the self. And when realized, lead man from death to immortality, as the opening prayer described. The opening prayer, this peace prayer, derived from the Brittari Upanishad, tells us about a goal, describes it in three separate ways. Lead us from the unreal to the real. Now, we are, there's a misunderstanding about that. People who are critics of Hinduism and Buddhism say, you dismiss everything as an illusion. But we, Christians or whoever, 
we take this world seriously and we don't ignore pain and suffering and we are full of compassion. The Buddhists cannot be full of compassion if they think and dismiss this whole world as just a mere illusion. So what do we mean by real and unreal? We really mean permanent, permanent and impermanent. This world has no permanence to it and everything that is an aggregate of connected things, parts, will also be disintegrated at one point in time. And that doesn't seem to hold any, any meaning. There has to be a question asked, what is the thing that holds everything together? And that itself cannot be comprised of parts. Otherwise, we have to look for another solid thing that creates some cohesion. So by real, we really mean the thing that never changes. The great description of the world from these ancient rishis who discovered these principles contained in the Vedas, not only from the karma kanda portion, but from the jnana kanda portion. These great sages, these great discoverers, using the power of concentration, using it as a laser beam to reveal all of these subtle things. They had a wonderful term for this world. They called it jagat. The thing that is always in flux, that always changes, comparing it to something like a tree, a vriksha. A vriksha is a tree that can be cut down. This is the world, and most people don't take this principle seriously. So if this world is always changing, we can characterize this world as impermanent and therefore unreal because something that is real doesn't change. We understand the reality and unreality from magic shows. Supposing an elephant suddenly appears in your room and disappears, you rub your eyes, but at the end of the day, you reason out, this somehow was some kind of illusion. Or if an elephant is there and suddenly changes to a mouse, you'll come to the same conclusion. Some magic trick is behind this. Some skill in illusion. And so this is where we get these various understandings. So lead us from this real, this unreal to this real. And then lead us from darkness to light. Darkness is always characterized by ignorance. And we want knowledge of a permanent type, something that would also be utilitarian for us, useful to us, something we can use in practical life. And finally, every person is concerned with death. Right now, this whole COVID pandemic is centered around people's wish to sustain life permanently, endlessly, against the threat of ending a life. Nobody wants to end it. Everybody wants a permanent, changeless, happy existence. And so lead us from death to immortality because death and change are seen to be part and parcel of what we are facing. And we know that it cannot be the end of the road. What is death? a comma, not a full stop. We have to take it in this way, but we have to discover it. And when we say lead us, it means that we cannot do it by our own self-effort. Our own self-effort is limited and will only produce limited results. So we need three things. First of all, we need our own pure intention. Secondly, we need scripture. And thirdly, we need grace, as it were. That is a corresponding movement of the truth itself that sits within us and urges us forward. So the Upanishads, therefore, they impart the knowledge of the self. Sri Shankaracharya, who was responsible for the revival and reestablishment of this non dualistic aspect of the Vedanta, the Advaita. He defines the Upanishad, he defines them in two separate places. A first, introduction to his commentary in the Kartu Upanishad. By the word Upanishad, he says, is denoted the knowledge of 
the knowable reality. It's not beyond our scope. And this knowledge splits up or destroys the seeds of worldly existence, namely ignorance, desire, action, etc. In the case of those seekers of freedom, who after becoming detached from the desire for the seen and the unseen objects approach the knowledge that is called Upanishad or the knowledge of Brahman is called Upanishad because of its conformity also to the idea of leading to Brahman. Upa, ni, is often broken down as sitting near. Shat, near. Ni, or shat, sitting, existing. Shat, near, ni. And we presume near a teacher. And this is a part of the third component of my message I mentioned that it requires some kind of grace. And this grace is presented not only as a scripture, but also as a teacher and a corresponding movement that pulls us and pushes us across the line of worldly existence, as it were. And secondly, in the introduction to his commentary on the Taitiri Upanishad, Shankaracharya tells us Upanishad leads to the acquisition of the knowledge of Brahman. The knowledge of Brahman is referred to by this word Upanishad. Or in the case of those who are devoted to it, it either loosens or ends such things as birth, old age, disease, death, etc., or because it takes us nearer to Brahman, or because the highest good is proximately embedded in it. And then he also adds, even books that contain that knowledge are also called Upanishads, as they contribute toward the knowledge. I mentioned 13 principles of Upanishads. Of course, there are others beyond that, but these are seen mainly to be sectarian in nature. And the original principal ones are attached to these Samhitas, this portion. It is in the Muktika Upanishad itself that gives us a list of this 108 Upanishads. And these are also class classified under different Vedas. But when we examine them properly, we see that they're not all of, in, of equal importance or even authority. And quite a few of them will eulogize more than anything else the sectarian aspects of this. And so we can see Upanishads attributed to Vaishnavism, Shaivism, and so on. So we'll focus our attention in this coming series that will start off with this overview on not only the overview of the Upanishads, but what would be the overview message of each one of these 10, we'll, we'll choose 10, 10 principal Upanishads. By the way, if you come to our library, we have these in different sets. First of all, we have eight of these Upanishads, principal Upanishads, with a beautiful um, translation by Swami uh, Gambirananda. You've been listening to Swami Vimokshananda, Life of Holy Mother. This is Swami Gambirananda's text. So Swami Gambirananda, great scholarly person, has used Shankaracharya's commentaries. And so eight Upanishads in two volumes are found there, volume one and volume two. And separately, we find Chandogi Upanishad, which is very extensive, and Brhattaranyaka Upanishad, comprising 10. And of course, Acharya Shankara has written elaborate commentaries on each of them. And they've been also commented on other teachers, not only Ramanujan Madhva, but others also who are credible teachers. Now, anything, therefore, that is a question and answer, not only in the scope of so-called Hinduism, but also any other religion or human perspective in the world, the answer has to be referred back to this text. I mentioned the uh, uh, Prasthanatraya, I mentioned the Brahma Sutras. So the Upanishads comprise one leg. The, uh, the Brahma Sutras comprise another leg, leg to make an explanation as a sutra literature and a systematization of the thought current in the Upanishads. 
But the third leg of it will be the Bhagavad Gita. You Upanishads have to have some commentaries and explanations because they are very subtle. Those who sit with me from time to time in the library here, and I tell them, pick an Upanishad, please, or pick a book, open it anywhere. And it so happens that wherever they open it is the right text for them. But it has no meaning unless you read the commentary and explain the commentary on it and explain what is meant because these are cursory texts and therefore seem to be abstract. And the abstract nature of them is not necessarily in the language or the expression. The abstract part is because of unfamiliarity with the idea that there is an Atman, there is a Brahman. And so the Advaitic principle can be summarized in three ways. Firstly, Brahman alone exists. There is no other existence. The root and the tree is the same thing. Secondly, the Atman and Brahman are the same entity. And thirdly, this whole world that we perceive as our own reality is a mistake. It's a misunderstanding. And it is a mitya. Mitya, it is just an apparition, an appearance. The aim of life is highlighted in what are called Mahavakyas in the Upanishads. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. We shouldn't misunderstand that. And we have to study the Upanishads to find out what is the meaning and then catch it up with what do I experience as this meaning? You cannot go around simply saying, I am Brahman, because you'll then have people misinterpreting that and using this term God, I am God. And I can lord it over everybody and I can destroy people because I am that. So that is not what we understand by it. This can only be accessed through the realization in meditation that says, I am that. Tattvamasi, thou art that. Pranyanam Brahma, consciousness is Brahman. This whole world has a basis, consciousness. It's not a nothing, nor is there seen to be any randomness in it. I am Atma Brahma, the self that is intrinsically in me and you and everyone. And everything also is Brahman. We don't get into a theology of creation ex nihilo. I am Atma Brahma, this self is Brahman. Saram, Karu, Idam, Brahma, all this is truly Brahman. These are wonderful, wonderful statements of high, beautiful, deep, subtle philosophy. Nothing to do with mental gymnastics. These are truths which need to be discovered step by step. In some cases, these discoveries are made instantly, but these cases we have to accept are rare. And we have to accept our limitations and be prepared to approach these great truths step by step with great patience and great sense of progressiveness. So we have to pierce through the veil of names and forms. That's the whole purpose of these Upanishads, which is the phenomenal world and arrive at the core. And there we find this thing called Brahman indicated in a neutral way, it, neither male nor female, having no gender. And for doing this, we must undergo some strenuous practice. We call this sadhana, spiritual discipline, spiritual practice. The mind of man has to be rendered pure. And all these methods that we mentioned, all these yogas, have this one aim in mind to purify the mind. And then we get a true understanding of the essential nature of the world. Everything then can be spiritualized in this way. And the fruit of spiritual life is self-knowledge. To the knower of truth, there is no more return to this world. It's an astonishing concept. Yasmat buya na jayati. Such a one becomes free from the round 
of birth, life, death, and attains that state of birthless, eternal, undecaying, and ancient state. Ajo Nityaha Sarvastha Dhyam Purano, man's true being is in the being of Brahman. That is the real home in which we must finally rest. So freedom, we have to understand, is our birthright. It is not something distant from us. It is not something that is unnatural to us. Automatically, we feel that it is true in the depths of our hearts. And therefore, when we hear the truth, the truth has a ring of truth also. So this is a brief introduction then to these Upanishads and their place in the Vedas. I might also mention that the social structure of ancient days was that each portion of these Vedas is taught for a specific function to each one of the stages in life. I have to explain that, what that means. The social structure was seen that the first 25 years of your life, based on a lifespan of 100 years, was all to do with studentship. First dozen years of your life, your parents take charge of you and teach you uh, good behavior, to be a, a good child, a loving child. And then from 12 to say 24 or so, 24, 25, Secondary and tertiary education is done in an ashram at a forest academy. And there the emphasis is on character building. Education was to do with character building. There's no point in understanding astronomy, linguistics, the Vedas, in other words, that contained all the knowledge of the day, phonetics, etc., science. No point in understanding any of these things if there's no good citizenship that goes with it. And so the next 25 years of your life would be dedicated to enacting good citizenship and departing students, and we'll cover this next week, departing students are given certain prayers, certain affirmations to take, to take with them into the next phase of their life, that is householder life, where they have children, and where they bring their children up, and there the ritualistic portion is necessary because the aim of life would be wealth production, artha. Artha, and then in the beginning, brahmacharya, studentship, first 25 years of your life, samhitas is a relevant portion of the Vedas. But the brahmanas are then the relevant portion of the Vedas for householder life. And then as a forest dweller is the next portion of your life. There's Vanaprastha, the next portion of your life where you live in a forest, probably you and your wife go and teach the students and you then start inquiring into the deeper things of life. And the reason why some of the Upanishads fall into the area of the Aranyakas is because these are residential inquiries. And then finally, the last portion of your life will be dedicated to the Upanishads, a deep inquiry into and experience of moksha, the ultimate end and aim of your life. If you see that from birth, somebody has an urge for monasticism, say, it is only because you never lived your hundred years and you get born back into and pick up the urge that you left off with. That's the idea. The whole of the universe is seen to be Brahman. I'm skipping along to various beautiful passages, and this comes from the Chandogya Upanishad. So let a person in all tranquility meditate on this visible world as beginning, ending, and breathing in Brahman. With that idea, I leave you with that or concept, so that you can have scope to meditate on it and uh, dwell on these great, great truths. 
this dwelling on these great truths, progressively going from the outside in, inward to the inside, is called meditation. On the 1st and 2nd of May, we have a meditation workshop. In that, you will discover what meditation is, what the misconceptions and obstacles to do with it are, and what should we adopt, and how should we steer our attention more to the subtle inward areas in an easy, natural way, progressive way. But all of this has, is based on this one truth called Veda. And that acts as a reference point, a foundation. And the Upanishads being the philosophical and spiritual portion, all references have to be there and all answers found there. This rule applies regardless of whether you are Christian, regardless of whether you're Muslim or Jewish, that this is the foundational reference point for perennial truth. Most scriptures will have a mix, and most scriptures we classify as smriti, the things that are remembered. As we know, memory is not reliable. Chinese whispers tell us, you tell somebody something at the beginning of a line, by the time it's gone round to the end, the 20th time, it comes out completely different. If you have a motor accident and you have five different witnesses, they will all relate different things. And so smurti, the thing that is remembered, has to be evaluated against this shruti, what is heard, the perennial philosophy. And all of these Vedas come down to us in a certain set meter, there can be no mistake about its antiquity. Some people ask how old are the Vedas and how old are the Upanishads it is an impossible question to answer. It can range from 600 BCE to something like 8,000 BCE. You take your choice. It is strong evidence for the Vedas themselves being uh, something like 8,000 years uh, or 10,000 years old based on the observation and reference to the Sarasati River and so on. But there's no doubt that the roots of the thought of these questions contained in the Upanishads is extremely ancient. It goes back to one statement in the Rig Veda, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahada Bharanti. Truth is one. Wise people call this variously. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, peace, peace, peace be unto all.